There it is, Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, Africa. The peak, 19,340 feet. Five of us will attempt to reach that point, led by our captain. Hi, I'm Zeno Chaya from Boston Bruins. I'm in Africa to climb Kilimanjaro, the highest peak in Africa. That's right, Chara, the tallest man in NHL history, climbing the continent's tallest mountain. Joined by Mark Brender of the humanitarian organization Right to Play, Daryl Lepic, NHL Productions executive producer, his documentary cameraman Mark Berg, and myself, Rob Simpson, host of Hockey Odyssey. And it truly is an odyssey. A six-day adventure, and we pick up the journey on day two, having completed a dusty 2,200-foot ascent the previous day, which put us at 8,600 feet, or about 2,600 meters. It was pretty good. It was a little uh, tired carrying 23-pound camera. Oh, that's right. You weren't carrying it. Yeah, I kind of dished it off a little bit towards the end there, but uh, it worked out good. This, this light is absolutely beautiful, these mountains, so it was great. Most Americans and Canadians don't reach this altitude on foot, and if they do, they're often actually on skis or on a snowboard, bundled up somewhere in the Rockies. For us, this was pretty much just the start. I don't think I'd ever been above 7,500 uh, at 8,000 feet, and uh, climbing 8, 10, 12%, 14% grades with a uh, big backpack and uh, heavy tripod or camera was, was hard. So I won't lie, it's no, uh, it's no joke. So I um, have some trepidation as to the next couple of days and how that's going to be. And already thought about how I can just remove a couple things from the bag and you know have the uh, porters carry some of uh, some of this stuff. So uh, sort of a little shift in thinking. We call that strategic reduction. Yes, and there's going to be definitely some strategic reduction going on for sure. Lightening the load is easy when you have a head guide, an assistant guide, and 19 porters carrying all of your gear for you. 21 Africans helping five North Americans up and down a mountain. They carried all of the camping supplies, the camp itself, and all of our extra personal gear. They're doing uh, basically a lot of work for us and uh, it wouldn't be uh, absolutely impossible without them uh, to uh, accomplish what we came, uh, came here to do and uh, summit Kilimanjaro. They are uh, extremely strong, uh, extremely fit. Uh, they're carrying uh, basically most of our loads, uh, preparing the camps for us uh, before, before we have a chance or before we come to, to, to them and um, you know, making meals which, which are really tasty. and. Uh, uh, Absolutely, you know, like it would be totally impossible without them. Day two was rigorous. We dug in and trekked hard upwards, sometimes at very steep angles for about four and a half hours. Pole pole, our head guide Alois Manyanga would repeat as we trudged along. Determination. Pole pole, uh, it's very important in this side of Kilimanjaro because. Uh, the way you go up pole pole, you are gaining instead of to go fast, fast for a long way and then it's stopping. But if you go slowly, you can walk for a long way. The idea was to acclimatize gradually in as scenic a manner as possible, to stretch the climb over five days and to reduce the likelihood of altitude sickness, the number one cause for failure. Pole pole. Pole pole. Ah, that is the principle of Kilimanjaro. No hurry, no hurry in Africa. <laughs> Kuna <laughs> Matata. Somehow we know. <laughs> Two geographic names to remember on this trek Moenzi and Kibo. Kilimanjaro is actually made up of the Twin Peaks, separated by a broad ridge or saddle that runs seven miles between them. To the east, Moenzi's northern wall blew away hundreds of thousands of years ago during eruption, leaving a jagged half-moon peak about 3,000 feet shorter than that of its more recognizable snow-capped neighbor to the west, Kibo, the highest area. That is Kilimanjaro. Early day two, how do you feel? Well, I'm not bad. Got a good night's sleep. Uh, about uh, three hours, and I woke up, and then. One hour, one hour on, one, one hour off. Uh, just finished breakfast and uh, uh, slowly 
surely going uphill going faster uh, that's the main thing I guess for this uh, climb just really really slow and slowly adjusting to the altitude that's so the key Swahili term pole 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 that's we've been uh, repeated by our main guide pole pole yeah pole pole it's uh, nice because uh, Take it slow. Yeah, gaining. Yeah. Instead of to go fast for a long way, it's better to go very slowly for a long way, you know? Over 10,000 feet. I'm climbing. Feeling good. Halfway into day two and near the end of the uphill, we visited a cave used by various tribes over the millennia and then cut to the southwest toward Mwenzi, angling slightly away from Kibo. Just prior to the turn, I recall saying to Chara, look ahead, look how close the mountain is getting. It's almost like he can grab it. But by the time the next four hour segment was over, a flatter but rockier trail, Kibo seemed further away. Our long second day had netted another 3,300 feet of acclimatization. We camped at 3,600 meters or 11,900 feet. <laughs> When Hockey Odyssey returns, day three, day four, and shooting a documentary. Z's been great. Z's been uh, phenomenal to work with. Uh, just a great guy, and uh, um, you know. Uh, just the, being able to uh, talk to him about uh, not only hockey but about climbing the mountain and uh, you know the, the kids that uh, they visited um, at the schools it's just been uh, it's been a great experience it's a good guy and uh, um, uh, looking forward to uh, doing more work with him back with more hockey odyssey right after this from Tanzania We're back on Hockey Odyssey in Tanzania, day three of our trek up Kilimanjaro. In the morning, we left early as usual for a relatively short and enjoyable hike to our next overnight location. In just less than four hours, we reached 14,200 feet, or 4,300 meters, and an incredible location beneath the spires of Mowenzi. The campsite sat on the bed of a volcanic crater, enclosed by ridges on two sides and above where molten rock had spilled out a million years earlier. While the location was beautiful, the altitude was taking a toll. Definitely harder. Uh, spoke to actually a few people um, and they say, some of them say it would be harder, some, some of them say it would be kind of uh, regular, you know, hiking, but uh, um, I'm 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 surprised how how hard it is uh, to walk. You know, uh, you know, even if you walk four or five hours, uh, but it's pretty steep. And uh, yesterday we had a day where we walked seven hours. Uh, today uh, we walk about three and a half. Unfortunately for the leg weary and sleep deprived, the day wasn't over. After lunch, we did a three-hour round trip to the top of the western ridge of the crater to again help acclimatize. It was a tiring, steep sometimes harrowing trek with loose footing atop a narrow strip of strewn lava rock. Moenzi towered just behind us and Kibo stood unobstructed to the west. It was impossible to take your eyes off the mountain and the 19,000 foot summit beckoned. Each day it's, uh, it's uh, you, you can feel at the end of the day that uh, uh, you, you are pretty tired. This has uh, no equal. This is uh, this is probably physically and uh, as uh, mentally demanding as anything I've ever shot. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's tough. It's been incredible. I, I've uh, loved every second of it. It's been um, pretty tough at times, but uh, the toughest yet to come. And, uh, but, you know, my God, you look at the views that we've had out here and the views that we're sitting with all the time and Wednesday and uh, Kibo and the whole Kilimanjaro mystique. And uh, it's been incredible. I would have paid to do this. Fortunately, I don't have to, because uh, we're going to get a real good show out of it, but I would have paid to, to be a part of this. This, when, I, when all said and done, for sure, it will be a top 10 life adventure that you would look back on and, and put up there with anything short of probably, you know, marriage and childbirth and 
the things which uh, which you know naturally would be above it. But this is it's amazing already. I just just the scenery and the experience has been absolutely phenomenal, and I expect that to continue for a couple days. For Lepic and cameraman Berg, the entire trek went hand in hand with shooting a documentary. While I shot what's being seen here with a little handheld for the Odyssey, these guys were shooting with serious high definition gear while building a comprehensive one hour documentary. That's just it, you know, you're not only are you uh, hiking and dealing with the elements, but you're also, when you're hiking, you're also thinking about, okay, I need to stop and get that shot. You're actually working as you're, as you're walking and sometimes uh, it just doesn't uh, click, your mind doesn't actually function in that uh, quick enough to say, okay, I need to stop and do this. And then once you do stop, it, nothing's quick. <laughs> everything's everything's slow so uh, it takes more time to set the tripod up it takes more time to change a battery on a wireless it, it it's uh, it's just more involved and um, and uh, takes more time as is most often the case on any shoot anywhere the cameraman does 90 percent of the physical work the producer in most cases comes up with ideas and helps direct things you don't have to tell them a whole lot what to do and that's great in situations like this you don't worry gosh is he getting are the shots good are they shaky does he know what he needs to do you don't have to worry about that and on a shoot like this you've got enough to worry about just in the elements and the, the atmosphere and um so he's he's great and he's in good enough shape that he can do this in this case good enough shape for berg meant trekking with the rest of us while setting up and shooting but as for carrying gear, something he would normally do himself anywhere else, it wasn't going to happen at this altitude without a lot of help. I'd be back at the hotel without the porters. I look, I turn around I, after climbing for an hour and a half or two hours, and and you know I'm hurting and, and I'm thinking, okay, you know where are these guys? Where's my camera? Because one of the porters carries my camera, one of the porters carries a, a, a pelican case with all the extra stuff, and then the other porter carries the uh, tripod. Um, and uh, I turn around and look at these guys after climbing, and I'm hurting, and I turn around, they're right there, and they look at me like, you want to shoot? <laughs> <laughs> From our perch below Moenzi, Berg took shots of Kibo, the main mountain in the distance, and we all soaked it in. We had one more normal night of camping, night number three, before we crossed to the big mountain on day four, prior to starting an overnight trek to the summit. Day four was uneventful yet dramatic, an exactly five hour hike across the saddle to a spot called the school camp, 15,400 feet or 4,700 meters up Kilimanjaro slope. This was base camp, windy and frigid. Boulder, tent. Dusk approached. We were in our final position prior to our most rigorous climb, a steep overnight trek up another 3,500 feet to the crater rim. Until this point, we had tried to avoid thinking too much about the summit. Actually, not not very much. Uh, I think I think after the dinner t tonight, uh, I'm gonna be thinking about it. I was just basically um, focusing on the walk and uh, putting one foot in front of the other. But uh, yeah, I was looking at it obviously, but really wasn't uh, concentrating on the summiting. Um, I saw some people uh, coming down from uh, from uh, from the top, and that was kind of uh, uh, motivation. But uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see after the dinner. We ate early and turned in at 7 p.m. No one slept. Just four hours later, at 11, we'd be standing outside in the dark, having donned four or five layers, winter caps and gloves and headlamps, to begin the final assault on Kilimanjaro. More trucking on Hockey Odyssey coming up next. Welcome back to Hockey Odyssey in Tanzania. Bruins captain Zdeno Chara didn't come to Africa just to climb a mountain. His first week on the dark continent was actually spent to the south in Mozambique as an athlete ambassador for the international humanitarian organization Right to Play. He was joined by Calgary Flames defenseman Robin Regeer, another proud supporter of the effort. 
Right to Play uses sports and games to mobilize local coaches and kids in mostly third world countries. Once the kids get together to play, the charity, along with other partnered humanitarian groups, take the opportunity to teach life lessons, including the dangers of AIDS and malaria, and also to promote peace. You can really tell when, you know, when we were visiting children in, uh, in Mozambique, in Maputo, in Shai Shai, there's a difference from just being there and then really being there and motivated and inspired. And uh, that's what he was. He was with the children and engaged in every second. There, he was holding uh, kids' hands and, uh, you know, in all the games he was participating. The kids were touching him to run around the circle all the time uh, in various games. So. I think it really, it really hit him, it really moved him, and uh, part of the reason it did that is because he gave a lot of himself, and I think it really showed. You can interact, you know, and uh, you can be withdrawn, you can engage somewhat, or you can engage fully, and he engaged fully, and seeing a 6'9", white guy play duck duck goose and chase around uh you know a, a six-year-old black girl it's it's an unbelievable visual and someone that'll always stay with me and he was he was beyond expectations last summer nhl network documented the efforts of two other right to play athlete ambassadors nhl defenseman andrew ferentz and steve montador during their visit to africa it's a cause already adopted by a number of canadian olympians and other international athletes and the message is growing among hockey players. Chara is fully on board and was happy to visit the kids and to drag Brender, right to play Canada's deputy director, onward to Kilimanjaro. Hopefully, you know, it will, it will start some really important thing back home and uh, what she's raised the money uh, for, the, for, for the right to play and, and support uh, uh, all, the, all, the, all the good things that the uh, right to play is doing. So uh, uh, it's great to have him around and uh, having beside us and uh, he's doing great. The right to play's motto is when children play, the world wins. And so it's when you get them playing and get them active that you can uh, teach about HIV AIDS and other diseases, you can uh, use education uh, or work in refugee camps, you can kind of build peace building um, into a lot of that, but it all starts with the coaches able to get the children involved and to put smiles on their faces and the coaches we saw in Mozambique were incredible at doing that. Chara, Brenda and myself all used the trek on Kilimanjaro to raise money for the cause, with friends and hockey people pledging financial support for our adventure. When we come back, the incredibly difficult journey to the summit and our excursion to Kilimanjaro reaches a pinnacle. Learn more about Right to Play and donate at righttoplay.com. We're back with more Hockey Odyssey after this. Back on Hockey Odyssey, given the fact that it was pitch black outside during our grueling six-hour climb to Kilimanjaro's crater rim, there is no video to share of the actual ascent. Bruins captain Zdeno Chara describes it. I've done some really tough training sessions, and uh, but this is nothing to compare uh, to what we uh, experienced. Uh, uh, basically, from uh, waking up at 11 at night after only like two hours of sleep. Um, going through the whole night climbing really steep uh, a hill um, was fresh stone underneath that we were slipping uh, losing uh, losing the ground uh, falling down at times uh, and obviously the alt altitude was uh, doing their their own and uh, uh, we had to stop on the way up probably like 10 times uh, everybody started to feel in it because of the altitude it's really it just feels like it's all you can do or all I could do to put one foot in front of the other, and it's minute after minute, it's hour after hour, and it's just progressively, uh, it was really hard by the end to just keep going, and uh, yeah, it was, it was absolutely exhausting. Our entire five-man unit successfully reached Gilman's Point at 18,650 feet, an official summit point. After congratulations, hugs, and photos, the inevitable question was raised. Who wants to go on to Uhuru Peak, the top of the continent, at 19,340 feet? It was another 700 feet upwards, about a kilometer away, along the crater rim on a narrow stone and ice path. 
Mark Brender tried for a short time and then declined. He was weary, not feeling so good. Producer Daryl Lepic said no. He had altitude symptoms. I said yes. Cameraman Mark Berg said yes. And finally, Chara said no. He was exhausted. He didn't want to slip. He didn't want to compromise his hockey. We were just dead tired. We were, we were, we were going like this for, 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 the whole, uh, for the whole week or six days. Uh, every day just walking and walking. And it was never ending story. We, we were being told it's going to be three hours. And instead of three, it was like four, four and a half. And then we had to do some uh, acclimatization uh, climbing. And that was another three hours. And uh, really, really exhausting uh, the whole uh, six days. So for sure, um, one of the toughest things, if not the tough, toughest thing in my, in my life I've done. The two of us grinded our way to the peak. Made it. Three porters and our head guide came with us. On the top of Africa, to our left and distant right, stood enormous glaciers. The crater floor sat more than a thousand feet below us. For ten minutes we took it all in and then departed quickly, absolutely spent and anxious for descent. It wasn't over because we had to go down uh, pretty much the same route we came up, uh, sliding again, uh, you know, through those, uh, you know, fresh stones and actually it felt like skiing, but it took us about three hours to get down to the, to the camp and uh, we were waiting for those other guys to come, uh, come back and uh, then we realized it wasn't the end, end of the day. We had to walk uh, another three and a half hours to uh, basically another camp. Eventually we all made the quick and vigorous descent to Kibo Hut at 15,420 feet. After some recovery and rest, we went down another thousand feet over three hours to our campsite at Harambo on the mountain's main trail. The descent helped ease and erase Lepic and Brender's altitude symptoms almost completely. We had finished a 16-hour day of trekking and hiking. Incredible trip overall, and, and uh, you know, being able to do that climb and that trek in six days in the tent, and then uh, and going up was a challenge that I certainly would have expected to be that tough. It was pretty incredible. Our sixth and final day was spent going downhill for five hours through moors and valleys and then through rainforest. The last leg brought an unexpected pleasure, a look at wild colobus monkeys and then black monkeys. In less than 24 hours, we had passed through at least seven different climate zones, from glacial ice pack on the mountaintop to the rainforest near the gate at the end of the trail. Our six-day Kilimanjaro adventure came to an end, a trip that not long after seemed more like a dream than reality. Captain Zdeno Chara of the Boston Bruins had led us on a true hockey odyssey.